Alright, so I'm making this video to help you with your evolution test. So go ahead and get your notes out and I'm going to go through the notes as we make the video. Okay, so the first thing is evolution and Darwin's theory of natural selection. So I'm going to start with the, I'm going to skip Darwin and come back to him in a second. But just as you go through the history people, um, there won't be many questions on the historians. You just want to know basically what they did. So Carlos Linnaeus was the first guy. And he said, everything can be classified and organized so that we can keep up with who, you know, what organisms are extinct and what organisms are being discovered. And we can discuss them through different, as in different countries. So um, the domains, remember there were, there's three domains. The eukarya, which are all the eukaryotic organisms. The archaea, which are the weird bacteria. And then... The, the real bacteria. So there's the three domains. And then there's, um, and then he organized them into the different kingdoms. And there's the Animalia kingdom, the plant kingdom, the protist kingdom, fungi, and then the two bacteria kingdoms, the regular bacteria, eubacteria, and the, the weird bacteria, archaea bacteria. And then from there, um, so it's phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And you just want to come up with a way to memorize that. Um, I think we said in class King, Phillips came over for Great Spaghetti, maybe? Or from Great Spain or something like that. Just come up with a way um, to memorize that. So Carlos Linnaeus, classification system, and he said that the scientific name of an organism is the genus and species. So remember, you write that first word capitalized like homo sapiens, and that, that'd be um, humans. So and that letter is lowercase, the S is. So capital H, the genus is capitalized, and the S, the species, is lowercase. And that naming system is binomial nomenclature. So two word binomial nomenclature. Okay, so the next slide, I just wrote down the other ones. And you just basically want to know what they did. So the first guy, um, Curvier, he said, and I was supposed to highlight and it didn't. There we go. Um, catastrophism. And so what he really did, he studied fossils. So he was the guy that, he looked at the fossils and he said they were found in sedimentary, which is layers of rock, and the ones on the top are the most recently died, and the ones below that have died before the ones on the top. So he basically said we can tell how old the earth, how old the organisms were based off their layer of stratification. Okay, the next guy is Hutton. And he said gradual, which really goes along with, with what Darwin said. He said the, the earth changes really, really, really slowly. So he agreed with Darwin on that. Okay, Lyle was next, and he said uniformitism. Uh, he was really a guy that studied rocks, and he was a geologist. So and he wrote the book Principles of Geology, and he said um, that... Uniform, like what's happening today as far as erosion is what happened 2,000 years ago as far as erosion. So it's uniform. What's happening today is what's happening 100 years ago. Okay, Jean the, Jean the Baptist um, Lamarck, he was the guy that said that what you acquire is what you inherit. So like if I worked out really, really hard, I'd have a muscular baby, which we know now is not true. Um... An organism doesn't choose to evolve. A, a bird didn't just say, hey, I want to have a longer beak so I can eat this kind of seed, so I'm going to grow a longer beak. And then my baby's going to have a longer beak. Um, we know that's not what happened. It had to happen slowly because of mutations um, and because of selection and mating. So um, remember that evolution isn't a choice. Um, and you don't inherit acquired traits. That would be like saying if your mom was bilingual, then, then you're bilingual. Well, you have to, to study the languages. He talked about giraffes and how 
the giraffe would stretch its neck and then it would have a baby with a stretched neck, which is not true. Uh, what happened is the, the giraffes with short necks died because they couldn't get the food. So when two giraffes with long necks mated, they had a baby with a long neck. Okay, and then Thomas Malthus, who's really important. So you definitely want to know Thomas Malthus. He was the guy who said that organisms struggle for existence. He said that organisms are going to reproduce. So here's the generations down here. And here's the number of organisms. He said they're going to reproduce exponentially until they reach a point at which they struggle. And now from the last unit, you know that that point is carrying capacity but they they're gonna reproduce and reproduce and reproduce until um, they, they they start to struggle for resources so um, he was the guy that said survival of the fittest so you want to know him for sure he's an important person Okay, so now we're, we're to Charles Darwin. So the next whole set of notes is about Charles Darwin. Um, he was the man that um, wrote the book, The Origin of Species, and he traveled um, around the Galapagos Islands. So here's a picture. He traveled around the world, um, and he studied mainly right over on the left hand side, the Galapagos Islands, right there. Um, and he was the one who said survival of the fittest. I mean, he's the one that said natural selection. So remember that natural selection is just that the, the stronger traits survive. Um, that nature, like weather and uh, different circumstances in the environment, decides who gets to survive and who doesn't based off their, based off their characteristics. He um, was on a boat called the HMS Beagle. He went around the world in five years. <clears throat> he said that um, organisms, organisms are the things that, or, or it's actually the organism that has the modification. And so descent with modification was the word that he used over and over again in his book, not evolution. He said that um, the offspring have to change. Not uh, That's what I was trying to think of earlier. The offspring... Are the are what lead to evolution. So there has to be a change in your gametes and your sex cells. So again, it's not just that organisms choose to survive, but they have mutations in their gametes, and that changes the organism or changes a trait. And then that trait, if it's a beneficial trait, may help it survive. And when it reproduces, that trait may be passed on. And you want to remember that. Populations evolve, not individuals. So populations are the things that evolve, not one organism. Okay, so here is, I just made a list of what what natural selection is. The stronger traits survive and get to reproduce. So if you have the right coat color to be camouflaged or you can hide or you can run faster, whatever that trait may be. Uh, environmental stresses affect the success rate. The you know, the environment would affect whether you get to survive or not. Populations evolve, not individuals. And life is a struggle. There's a limited number of space and resources and mates, and life is a struggle. Artificial selection, which I think you understand, is when, when people choose. It's not um, natural, it's man-chosen. Remember we talked about the English Bulldogs, how... We have chosen those animals and those overweight animals that can't even have babies except through C-sections. So we, we choose the biggest strawberries or the fastest horses or the colored organisms and we, we, we choose to make them. So we select. It's not even um, natural selection or sexual selection where like the bird picks the prettiest peacock. People choose which ones mate. Okay, you want to know um, divergent evolution. And remember, that's where one organism divided, and now there's two organisms. So one species divided, divergent divided, and now there's two. Um, examples of 
or proof of divergent evolution would be the homologies. And there's three homologies. There's the structural homologies that you see here in the arm. So um, some people think that the similarities in the bat and the similarities in the human lead to common ancestors. So you just want to know that that's why it's important is the homologies um, lead people to think common ancestor. Homology, same. Same structure. So you're looking at same structures in the arm. You're looking at similarities in the embryo. You're looking at similarities in DNA or amino acids. Remember, amino acid is your uh, protein sequence. That's, amino acids make up proteins. So homologies are similar things that lead to common ancestor. Divergent evolution really means that one species divided and made two. Opposite, but both are, both are. Um, it's not like you believe one or the other. They're both occurring. So convergent evolution is when two organisms are evolving at the same time and they're getting the same trait, like being able to fly here, the squirrels, but they're not related. So the squirrel in Australia and the squirrel in North America are both evolving to be able to glide. But no one thinks that they got this trait and divided into two different squirrels. No, the, the North American squirrel has evolved to learn to glide, and the Australian squirrel has learned to, to glide. And it's because that's the beneficial trait. So convergent evolution and proof of convergent evolution would be analogous structures. So if you think of the word, um, it's going to help you. So homologous was same structures. Homologous was same structures. Analogous is different structures. So um, proof of analogous structures would be something like this. An insect and a bird can both fly. So they've evolved to be able to fly. However, they're not the same. They have different structures. Birds have muscles and bones, and insects have cartilage in there. So that would be analogous. So you want to know convergent evolution and analogous structures. Um, we talked about an endemic. An endemic is a species that, that's only in one place. So an organism like, you know, the pygmy elephant, that little elephant, that little short mini elephant, was only on that island that we talked about. Or um, So an organism that's only in one place is an endemic. And then one thing I didn't mention, the vestigial structure or vestigial organs, that would be an organ or structure that we don't use anymore. So that we don't use it, so people are, you know, maybe losing the function. So um, people used to think the appendix didn't have a function, but now we think it actually plays a small role in the immune system. Um, but wisdom teeth would be another example. Okay, so we're starting now with microevolution. Remember, microevolution is a change in allele frequency. Changes in P's and Q's. Dominant versus recessive is the percent changing. So microevolution leads to macroevolution. And macroevolution is a new species or speciation occurring. So first we're going with microevolution. And I, I chose to put this picture of the peppered moths here. Remember the peppered moth story. There's light moths and dark moths. And before the Industrial Revolution, predators ate the dark moths because it had the trait that was selected against. So nature selected against that one. Um, after the Industrial Revolution, when the atmosphere or buildings were darker, you can see that predators would choose the light one. So the, the allele frequency changed where, let's say, the light one is recessive. So more, there were probably more Q squares before the Industrial Revolution. Um, after the Industrial Revolution, so that would be after the Industrial Revolution, there's, there's going to be more P squares, or two PQs. So, so that would be an example of the allele frequency changing. Okay, so remember that a species... A same species has similar DNA, but as a species is something that can produce living, fertile offspring. So that's what makes all humans in the same species, is that we can produce living, fertile offspring. 
all dogs the same species, even though they look much, you know, way different. They can produce living fertile offspring. Okay, so um, the genetics of a species has to be very similar too. Okay, so um, the next thing is the Hardy-Weinberg theorem. Remember the, the formula, P plus Q equals 1. Remember that's like a frequency. Okay, P is the dominant allele. Q is the recessive allele, and that equals 100%. P squared is homozygous dominant percent. That's the population. So when you, when you, when you get an answer for P squared, it should be like 0.5 or, or 0.49 or 0.5. Two seven. Those are going to be a percentage. So it's like twenty seven percent of the population is p squared. So if you're given a number like seven out of ten, you got to divide for per p squared. Okay, q squared is the homozygous recessive, and then two p q is heterozygous. Okay, so in order for a population to be in Hardy Weinberg. Um, equilibrium. That's what it'll say in the question. It's either in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or it's not. If it's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, it's not evolving. Not evolving. Okay, so if a population is not evolving, it has to have a large population, no organisms moving into or out of the population, so no immigration, um, no mutations, no random traits. The mating has to be perfectly random. All the peacocks can't be choosing the, the prettiest peacocks, so it's got to be random. And then no natural selection, so the weather doesn't play a role on whether you survive or not. And this is not realistic. All populations are evolving because the weather is changing and, and selection does happen. Uh, you know, mating isn't random. We choose who we mate with. You know, we select. Nature does, as far as organisms go, nature does select who gets to survive. So populations are evolving. Um, this question may be asked one of two ways, so pay attention here. It may be said, the question may say, um, what are the five factors for a population not evolving? And that would be these five. Or it may say, um, what are the five factors that are, you know, that could be occurring if a population is evolving? So if a population is evolving, it's because there is natural selection, because there is not random mating. So just pay attention to uh, if you see a question like that. Okay, Hardy-Weinberg problems. You know that one of the math is going to be a Hardy-Weinberg problem. Instead of making another video on that, if you go to the, the evolution video list, scroll down to the bottom, there's three videos that say if you need more help with Hardy-Weinberg. You need to look at those because there's going to be a Hardy-Weinberg question on this test and on the real AP test. So make sure you look at those and... Make sure you come to class knowing how to do Hardy-Weinberg. Okay, so remember that. So we're moving on to microevolution part two. Um, and variation is good. Variation helps a population to survive. So this shell may help it to survive in dark conditions and this one in light conditions. Um, so variation is good in a population. It's going to help the population survive for hundreds of years to come. So your notes say variation is key to surviving in a changing environment. Um, variation exists between individuals and populations unless the, the population is like a clone, which would not be beneficial. And it also says variation on the most basic level will only come into existence with a change in DNA. So remember that a mutation is a change in DNA. And I think we know by now evolution is change in DNA over time. Okay, so remember the process of sexual reproduction. Okay, so sexual reproduction is how we get variation. And there's three reasons that we have variation because of sexual reproduction. So the first one is the crossing over, which happens in prophase 1 of meiosis. Prophase 1 of meiosis, so remember those homologous chromosomes cross, and they switch DNA, and they separate, and that's what makes you and your sister look different. You got that egg, and your sister got that egg, so, so you got this one, maybe your sister got this one. Even though you have the same mom and dad, you got different combinations of your mom and dad's 
DNA. Half of your DNA is from your mom and half is from your dad. But you got a different combination. So they crossed over. But then those chromosomes sort independently in anaphase 1 and anaphase 2. When the chromosomes separate, when the cell goes from diploid to haploid, you may, got, you may have gotten, again, you may have gotten blue or you may have gotten red. But the chromosomes separate independently of one another. And then the third thing is random fertilization or even random mating. But one egg is going to drop every month and one sperm is going to get inside the egg. Which one? That's random. Um, who the mate is, that may be random. So you want to know that these are the three things that lead to variation because of sexual reproduction. Crossover, the assortment, independent assortment in anaphase 1 and 2, and then random fertilization. Okay, so the next thing, genetic drift. And look at the word, genes change, drifting. And I got two ways. The bottleneck effect, that's where you have this whole population right here. And let's say something happens and it wipes out, it kills all these people or all these animals. Not because of natural selection, but maybe just like a hurricane randomly. And that's the only population that survives. So now this small population right here has to rebuild the population from just those. So the genes are going to change. The, the P's and Q's are going to be different. It looks like we completely got rid of yellow. So there's no yellow in this population. So that trait is gone. It completely disappeared because of this bottleneck effect okay and and founder effect is really the same thing except it's not from a disaster like this one was it's because these people right here moved to a new island and they started over so where this one was predominantly blue when they moved the founders are predominantly red so it's really the same thing um, the bottleneck effect is just natural and the founder effect is where they move they like the founding fathers they moved Okay, and then gene flow, just know that that's on purpose. That's like migration on purpose. So remember um, remember that natural selection always has, it's always good. Those organisms that die because nature selected against them, it's, the animals are only getting stronger and stronger and stronger. They're getting better, smarter and bigger or faster, or, um, being able to blend in with the environment. So it's good for that population to survive. Because populations are trying to survive and reproduce. So that's good for them. Okay, and now I'm on to microevolution part three. Um, I'm just going to hit those two dark words at the top fast. Phenotypic polymorphism. Look at the words. Many phenotypes. So you got many phenotypes. So something like blood grouping, A, B, A, B, and A. There's four. There's four phenotypes, and your blood type is a phenotype because that's the gene that's expressed. Or like um, skin color. There's many different skin colors. So many poly phenotypes. And phenotype is outward, um, the, the traits being expressed. Um, on the, the genotypic polymorphism right here, the, I, m I messed up. Sorry. So phenotypic polymorphism is in your example is A, B, A, B, and A. And there are different phenotypes, so that would be an example for phenotypic. But this is showing the different genotypes. So remember that I told you everybody has the, the gene for melon, which it makes dark, make brown in your skin. Well, some people have more copies, so th this person would have more copies than this person would because this person doesn't have as many dark pigments. So that really it's just the same gene, but this person, I'm just guessing, this person has 75 copies of that gene, and this person only has 25 copies of that gene. And somewhere right here in the middle has 40 copies of that same gene. I mean, this is what makes hair color um, and skin color brown. Okay, so many phenotypes, like A, B, A, B, and O, many genotypes. So this is dealing with, like, the numerical values. How many copies of melon does someone have? Okay, and then gene diversity. So looking at genotypes that are present. So when you're looking at the gene diversity, it's just 
the different types of DNA that all the, the whole species has. So that would be your gene pool. Um, nucleotide diversity looks at nucleotide sequence of DNA, so the different sequences. And y'all remember us talking about how they've mapped out the human genome and they, they know which gene makes which enzyme. Okay, so looking at this picture, remember sickle cell is because of a point mutation. And uh, this one amino acid is different. So the hemoglobin doesn't function properly. So they have sickle red blood cells. Um, and that's the, the main phenotype. But there's different, um, there's different uh, traits that are affected. So one of them would be the heterozygous advantage. So this person has sickle cell. So they are a sufferer of sickle cell. This person does not have sickle cell. So they do not have sickle cell. But the advantage is lie in the heterozygous so that's called the heterozygous advantage it's where a person doesn't have sickle cell but they are resistant to malaria so that would be a beneficial thing in certain parts of the world if you're resistant to malaria okay Klein um, which I think is something interesting so make sure you understand this because it showed up on the test year before last um, it's just where that you can tell from looking at this picture the long the taller plants on this right here on the bottom, the taller plants are on the bottom, and at the top, the plants are shorter, maybe due to altitude or um, just a different environment. Maybe it's more dry, the, the soil is different because it's on the top of the mountain. So we're looking at 3,000 meters high, which is really high. Um, this is difference between population um, because each population exists in a different environment. So, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe over here, there's not wind, where the, when the wind blows, it wouldn't get to that side. Probably not as much rain over there. So, just know the word Klein is different populations because of different environments. Okay, and then selection, I also think this is important. Um, the next thing, so, you want to get this. Okay, so this is different selections or evolutionary flow is what your notes say. Okay, so remember we talked about a bunch of examples for this. So you've got the dotted line here, now it's purple, is the original population and for whatever reason the gene flow is shifting and we're talking about rats here, so the, the rats are getting darker. And we'll just, to make it easy, we'll talk about um, their, where they're living, their background. So maybe they're living on the sand, so somewhere light. So the lighter ones, I'm sorry, maybe they're living, you know, on the grass or the dirt, so it's somewhere dark. So the lighter ones are getting eaten. The darker ones are surviving in this case. So, and this, this first one is directional selection. The gene flow is going in one direction. Uh, I think another example here would be Jurassic. They're getting longer. All of them are getting longer. Okay, with... Diversifying selection. So here's your original one. For some reason, the light ones are surviving and the dark ones are surviving. But those ones right in the middle are not surviving. So nature is selecting against the organisms right in the middle. My example was um, fleas. There's fleas that live in the sand. And then there's dark fleas that live on, like, um, in your backyard and on your dogs and stuff. But there's no medium colored. So the medium colored ones are getting chosen against. Okay, and then stabilizing selection is where both extremes are dying, but one, one size is surviving. And what we talked about in class was human baby size. Little bitty premature babies don't always live, and great big babies don't always live. There's like complications with pregnancies and things like that. Right down the middle, babies who are 6 to 8 pounds are the most beneficial, so they're surviving. So you want to know these three things for sure. We've got directional selection, be able to draw this, be able to provide examples, directional selection, diversifying or disruptive, or both extremes, but the middle is not any good. Okay, and then stabilizing, the middle is what's the best. Both extremes are dying. So here both extremes are surviving. All right, so you want to know that. This is just a picture of the heterozygous advantage I was talking about with sickle cell. 
um, different populations, different parts of the world, um, heterozygous advantage, they like to ask that on the AP test. So you want to make sure you know people who are carriers, so big A, little a, are resistant to malaria. A key term right there would be resistant. They're not immune. They're just resistant. Okay, um, intrasexual and intersexual. Intra, which is shown right here with the polar bears. Intrasexual um, is where the males fight for the reproductive rights. So I think about like two male deers fighting for the female deer. Intersexual is where the women get to choose. So the males strut out, you know, they're pretty peacock feathers. These really pretty ones are the males. The males strut out, and the woman gets to choose based off the female peacock, based off the, the color, or maybe based off the song, or maybe based off the, the dance, like the blue-footed boobies. We talked about the dance. So um, you want to know this is sexual selection right here. Okay, hox genes. Um, this is in the on the next one. So hox genes are genes that are master control genes. So, so there's a copy of genes that all humans have. And during development, they turn on and off other genes. And they make our position, like your lungs location, your heart location. You've got two eyes, two ears on the sides of your heads, two arms. So these are just developmental genes. And they turn on and off other genes to make us formed the way that we are. Our structure, um, so it says positional and pattern genes are in the group of Hox genes. So you want to know master control genes and Hox genes. Okay, so we're on to now the macroevolution notes. And you want to know that macroevolution is a new species or speciation. So we said earlier that microevolution leads to macroevolution. Okay, so you want to know this, this slide's important. Two words. Anagenesis is where one bird evolves into another species. So... I think a good example here that we talked about in class would be Staph aureus, the bacteria. And, you know, in the 20s, penicillin killed it. Now it doesn't. So Staph changed. Staph was, Staph has evolved and evolved and evolved and evolved, and, and now penicillin isn't killed by Staph. I'm sorry, Staph isn't killed by penicillin. And so, and so now this is Staph, and this, this Staph is gone. So the evolution of a new species, even though it has the same name, its DNA is much different. So it's a new species, and that's called anagenesis, without break. Cladogenesis is where you had one, and now there's two. So there was a break in evolution. So your notes tell you anagenesis, there's no break. Cladogenesis, there is a break. Um, just, just as an example, let's say that there was one elephant on the earth. Just one. And it evolved, and now there's two. Like two different species. And remember, we define a species because it can make living, fertile offspring. And that's your next slide. Okay, so there's this is the biological species concept. So this is a how we define what a species is. Remember, they can make living, fertile. Fertile means they can have a child. Um, fertile offspring. So there, these are reasons why you couldn't have an offspring. Reasons why you're not. So there's prezygotic, which is first. The prezygotic ones are on the top. Here. And postzygotic ones on the bottom. So prezygotic is before the zygote is formed. There's a problem. The zygote never formed. Okay, so habitat. They live in the wrong place. Remember the example we talked about in class was um, a snake. A snake that lives in the water. A snake that lives on the, the ground. Their DNA may be similar enough, but their habitat is different, so they can't mate. So the zygote never forms, so they're not the same species. Temporal would be timing. Um, the, the timing is off. You know how some organisms go into heat, like dogs or things like that. Um, so timing is off. So temporal, timing, they have different times that work. Behavioral isolation would be their behavior isn't good enough. Like their song or their dance isn't working, so they never get to actual make an offspring. They never get to make the, the zygote. Mechanical, the, the reproductive parts don't fit. Um, 
a toy teacup miniature itty bitty teeny tiny dog and a great game. The parts don't fit. Um, I think the example given in the book is about snails. Some snails shell turn one direction, like let's say clockwise, and the other snails shells turn um, the other way. And they, their parts don't fit when they when they come out of their shell. Their reproductive organs don't fit together, so they can't mate. Okay, and then um, gametic isolation is the last one, and that's where the sperm and egg don't recognize each other. And I think this is this is one that kind of plays back throughout the whole year. Cell reception. The sperm. Remember, the sperm has the acrosome tip, would interact with the surface proteins on the egg. And when they don't recognize each other, they wouldn't ever form the zygote. So two humans, a sperm, a human sperm, and a human egg, the sperm is going to recognize the egg. Reception, it's going to enter, it's going to touch the cell membrane of the egg. That'd be reception. Transduction is where um, the DNA of the sperm enters into the egg. And then the response would be that the two sets of DNA combine to make the zygote. So, reception, transduction, response there. But if they don't recognize each other, then they never make the zygote. Okay, post-zygotic barriers. Um, the first one, so this is where the zygote forms, but it's not a living fertile offspring. Okay, so reduced, the first one is reduced hybrid viability. And this is where the organism can't survive for long during development. So almost like um, the baby dies before it's ever born or maybe right after it's born. So they make a zygote, but the baby has so many complications because the DNA was different. Okay, reduced hybrid fertility. Reduced fertility. It's like a mule. It can't have a baby. Less fertilized or not fertilized. So this is less not living. This one's not fertilized. And then hybrid breakdown is where... Um, the baby, there is a baby, and it can reproduce, but maybe just once or twice. Like, not, it can't reproduce fully. It can't reproduce as many times as the other organisms if it would have been the same species. So that's just one way to define bi um, species is the biological species concept. And the next one is ecological species concept. And this is just saying if an organism has the same niche, then it's the same if two organisms have the same niche, then they're the same species. Um, do y'all remember from ecology competitive exclusion? Saying that two organisms with the same niche can't, two different species with the same niche can't survive in the same area. And we talked about how deer and kangaroo have the same niche, so they can't survive in the same place. Okay, well. If a deer and a kangaroo have the same niche um, and in the same place, then they would be considered the same species. But since they can't live together, they're not the same species. So that's just another way to define it by looking at the niche. Um, phylogenetics would be looking at the DNA or the amino acids. So this, this is showing um, they're comparing amino acids for what makes, I think, hemoglobin? Yeah, hemoglobin. So humans have 100% identical. We all make hemoglobin, which is what carries oxygen in our red blood cells. Well, this monkey, we have 90%, 95% similarity in that one amino acid, not in our whole bodies, in that one protein. Us and monkeys have 95% similarity. So there's only 5% difference um, in, in hemoglobin, that one protein. 87% in the mouth. 69%, you know, so just showing similarities there. Okay, so go ahead and flip over to macro part two. This is really important too. How do we make new species? You have allopatric and sympatric. Allopatric is different locations. So remember we got those petri dishes and we put the fish in two different petri dishes or in the same petri dish the paper fish. So allopatric in, is where a new species evolves but in a different location. Sympatric is where a new species evolves in the same location.
a ring species is just where it evolves around a barrier. So like maybe the Great Wall of China, an organism has evolved, it changes around a barrier. Okay, and then adaptive radiation is where the organism moves and changes. It evolves. And then it moves. So I think moves is like radiates. It radiates and it adapts. It radiates, it adapts. It radiates, it adapts. So I could have also, I could have kind of started here and said it radiates out and it evolves. And then it radiates out and it evolves. It radiates out. So this was part of the, um, the Galapagos Island study when Darwin studied them. He said they change as they move out. Okay, and then, so here's just a picture of Darwin's finches and how they are, they are all different and different beaks allow them to eat different things. Auto polyploidy, auto self, poly, many, ploidy is like the number of chromosomes. So this is where um, different numbers of chromosomes because of self fertilization. So many numbers of chromosomes. So not just diploid. And then the next word, um, allopolyploidy, is cross fertilization. So different numbers of chromosomes because of cross fertilization. Remember we said that our cells are diploid and some are you know our sex cells are haploid, but some plants are triploid or polyploidy, which means they have more than two sets of chromosomes. Okay, punctuated equilibrium. Is just showing that there's stable, 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 stable with no change right here. And then there's a break. There's like a big fast change. And then there's stable, 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 break. So like um, things were really stable and then when there was snowball earth which made forced change. And then there, things were really stable and it forced another change. Um, another example would be gradualism so slowly changing one organism changes and has offspring that are different distinct with modification and it takes a really long time for that trait to be um, to be popular or to be common in that species so it's really really gradual um, and I think I think both are true I think both I think organisms change very slowly you know but I think also sometimes they're forced to change Fast, a species is or forced to change fast because of, you know, a tsunami or something like that. Okay, and then, um, okay, so we're on to um, just the dating of the Earth, and I think you learned a lot about this when you watched the the debate. There is. Um, absolute or radiometric dating, which is based off the life of carbon. The as carbon loses those electrons, the the half life of that carbon element. Okay, and then there's relative fossil dating, which is where the the organisms on top that are the fossils on top are younger than the fossils below that. So they they base how old it is based off what sediment or what layer in the soil. Um, and we we said both are. Um, really good estimates, and they're just that, they're just estimates. Okay, so this is of the last set of notes, and this is important, it always shows up on the test. Um, the first one, it, the first picture here is a character table. The ones mean they have it, the zeros mean they don't, and we spent a lot of time on this in class, so I think you have it. Okay, so from the character table, they've built a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree. And so, like, if you look at the amniotic egg, everything above the amniotic egg, the turtle and the leopard, have an amniotic egg. Everything below it doesn't. So the salamander, the tuna, the lamprey, and the lancelet don't have an amniotic egg. Remember, that's one difference in an amphibian and a reptile, is the amniotic egg. Um, hinge jaw. Tuna has it, lamprey doesn't. So you've got to be able to read one of these. And then I threw on this picture just because I thought uh, that I looked at one this complex. And sometimes they ask you questions about a picture like this. So let's see if you can tell that 
Um, well, obviously the, I'm just going to pick two, the marsupial and the wombat are more closely related to each other than they are related to the elephant shrew because it, it shows that they're on one clad. Okay, and we could say something along the lines of right here is common ancestor to all of these. But the squirrel and the guinea pig are the most closely related. Um, we could say the beaver gave rise to the squirrel and the guinea pig. So you just have to be able to read one of these and see, um, even though, like, let's say horse. No, maybe highlight better. Like horse and camel are close to each other on the graph. The horse and the cat are more similar. The the horse and the cat dog, bear, weasel, seal. I guess those should have commas. I don't know. Anyway, um, those the these two, the horse and the cat dog lines, are more similar than they are to the camel because they're on that same clad. So I just threw this on here. So you can kind of look at that, but um, as you're studying, make sure you go through all the notes. Evolution is um, really important. There's a lot of evolution questions on the AP test, so make sure you understand this, and good luck.